and welcome to the Coolmore Hospice Care podcast, Two Old Chuffs, A Tale of Two Hospices. I'm Tamsin Thomas. And I'm Jean Stone. And today we're reflecting back on the last financial year, 2020. Do you remember 2020? It seemed to avoid me. I, I lost it completely. Into 21. Um, we have written a, a digital newsletter, a digital impact report, if you like, called Our Resilience and Revival, which looks back at that year, at how tough it was, but how we fought back from everything that the pandemic brought to us. And it all starts in April 2020, Gina, which for you must have just been the worst month. Um, it, it was, and it all happened so very quickly, I think, really. Um, and life changed for all of us in the hospice during that time. Um, and I think, um, you know, resilience is a really good and strong word to, to think about how we've been over that time and how we move forward, really, kind of how did you, had you ever been through anything like that before? Um, I've had a little dalliance with swine flu um, over the years. That, that thought it was going to be a big pandemic and actually didn't, didn't manifest in the way that we thought it would have done clinically um, way back along now. But actually nothing, um, nothing like this that affected um, you know, all of us so quickly. And I remember looking at the news and thinking it was happening a long way away. And then all of a sudden it was here with us in the UK and then obviously affected all of us as to how we kind of lived our lives, moved on, worked um, and you know the hospice was a very little part of, of that but actually um, had a huge impact for us as an organisation. Were you scared? Yeah, I absolutely um, was because you are worried about your own family, you're worried about the staff that you, um, you manage, you, the people that you work with. Um, and everybody was in a very similar situation. There was very little direction um, because it's new to everybody. And so there was very much a feeling of, um, you know, working our way through that together, finding our own path and doing that in a, a, a sensible and metered way that meant that we could be as safe as we could be for patients here. Um, and also recognising that given the work that we do, actually it's really important for people to have um, a, a, a good memory of end of life. We're, we're, very, um, we're very passionate about that being a, a big thing for us here at the hospice and we could see that that was going to be quite different if we didn't take measures to make that as right as we could. Well, one of the people who writes in our digital impact report about what it was like on the front line, one of our key workers, if you like, is Claire Collins, who's a senior staff nurse at Mount Edgecombe Hospice. Claire, for me, one of the one of the things that that struck with me from what you said was that collective fear, but that collective teamwork. We're going to carry on. What what was it like for all of you? Well, we kind of had to put those sort of emotions behind us and, and concentrate on our work and to strive to look after our patients in the, you know as we've always done, but within those restrictions to keep it all safe. So um, I think working as a team and we all banded together and you know we felt we were in the battle zone if you can see it like that. But the unknown because none of us knew. How things were gonna gonna be, and we all like like um, Gina said, we all have our own family to look after as well, and you know you have to you know, you have to wait up how it was gonna work. And you have to put a brave face on, don't you? Because yeah. you've got these patients who still need yeah. to know that you're confident and you're there and you're yeah. caring. Yeah, absolutely, and, you know they they're relying on us to keep our standards up and give all that care that we've always done and uh, and the families need support in. So it was it was a tough time, really tough time. And and was how difficult was it with the restricted visitors as well? Because yeah. for me that's yeah. how difficult is that for a family? Yeah, I mean, you know, in the beginning it was we had two patient two family members for each patient, which I suppose a lot of people think that's really good because you know they couldn't see anybody in, in Chennai school so at least they could have the chance of visiting but um, if there was 
lots of family members you wanted to visit and it was difficult for them. If you've got a family, you've got three daughters, who do you decide is coming in? You know, so that was, it was really hard for us. I think it was really important to us, wasn't it, from the very start to think, well, actually, we need to recognise when people are at the end of life. Yes. That's such yes. an important time for everybody. Um, and, and Claire's right, actually, people, we ended up having people ringing us to say, you know, actually, what are your visiting hours before before patients and relatives came in, which was really difficult for the team, wasn't it? Because, yeah. yeah. you know, you know, we're used to having people 24 hours a day, you know, bus loads turn up at yeah. the front door with and, the dog. With and the, we would do anything yeah. to achieve that patient's, the, their yeah. goals and their wishes and to who have, who they want with them. And, and sometimes we do have lots of family in and it's, you know, but we, you know, we accommodate people. So, um, and we go with what they would like. So to have that restriction, um, yeah, it was, it was a hard time. I'm, I'm just horrified. That's a bit like your worst nightmare, isn't it? When you have to make a decision. You see it sometimes, you know, debating subjects. You've got three daughters and only yeah. two can go in. Yeah. How do you make the choice? Yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be very difficult, isn't it? But actually, people have been very understanding. And, yeah. um, you know, I think they've worked in different ways. And we've found different ways, haven't we, on the walls of using, you know, iPads and phones and being able to kind of keep people in contact that yeah. way. Yeah, technology is kind of, you know, um, it's been in the background, but I think it's kind of the forefront now, isn't it? More so, because it's our way of communicating uh, with the families and things. So, so yeah, they, they've been, they have been understanding and, you know, it's hard for us, um, but I think they did, overall it's been, you know... And, and I guess it was a collective... Uh, um, pandemic wasn't it it wasn't a pandemic that just affected uh, the key workers no. it was a pandemic affecting everyone so it wasn't like no one knew about it does that make a difference with it did that help with the understanding I think so and then some some families were like forgot all of that they just were concentrating they wanted to see their, their, pet, their, their loved one and that was all that mattered um, so we did have moments where you know, we had to sit down and frankly talk with them and explain what was what was happening. So and why we have to do those things. So it had its moments, but uh, on the ball, most people have been very, very happy with what we've been providing. So. Well, bravo! I mean, it was extraordinary. It, 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 I know it was hard for people who got sent home. Yeah. But I can only imagine that how difficult it was for people who had to come to work. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's that dilemma each way. Yeah, it's a kind of random for me, really. I, I, you know, I just went to work, did my job, and, you know, it kind of helped me get through things. And I think we all felt like that. That, you know, we had our job, we were looking after our patients, and that's, that's the thing that got us through it, really. And then, of course, we were uh, developing at the time our community services so we could uh, go out and, and meet people where they were comfortable. And I'm looking at Claire Bray now from our community services team. And suddenly we couldn't do that anymore. Yeah. So what were the conversations going on in, in your area? Well, everything we did was out in the community, whether it was seeing carers and patients or whether it was meeting with professionals and attending events so literally we were we were just out all the time that's what we did so we just sort of sat down and had a bit of a okay how can we still try and do what we were building in the community but without being in the community how can we do it and we just moved to telephone and, and virtual which has worked has worked really well. <laughs> wake up. we just moved to telephone <laughs> yeah. and virtual yeah well, I think it was quite simple, simple was it <laughs> simple but I think actually it enabled us to do things that perhaps we'd thought about as a long-term goal but enabled us to do them a lot sooner than maybe we would have done if you know if it hadn't have happened um, and it's been great it's developed our services and it's made us think about where we want to be as a community team and actually what is needed in the community which is which has been great and, and what was needed I mean how, how did you bring people along with that so really our first thought was our virtual, well, it was our community cafes that we were starting to set up, which was a place where people could come, uh, both patients and carers and professionals, 
just to talk, um, be signposted to what services were available. So we moved that to Facebook um, and that's great, that's still going. And Lolly and I, we just share information on there daily and covers a multitude of things, end of life, cancer, mental health, all sorts of things, finance, carers, and we share information on there and that's, that's growing really well. We've got um, over 100 members on there now and that's both patients, carers and professionals, which is great. And then what we really noticed was with the collaboration with Cornwall Bereavement Network, that there was a real gap for people to be able to access bereavement support. So we teamed up with them initially and we offered our phone lines and people to answer the phones. And we were really a signposting service. So people, when they'd been bereaved, they could ring, they could find out what else they could access and we would signpost them on. Uh, and we did that for about six months. And then we handed that service over to PALS and it's still with PALS now. And after we handed it over, we thought, well, actually, there is a need for people to access bereavement support by phone at the minute, because obviously we couldn't do anything face to face. And we wanted to offer a service that was just a listening ear, basically, where people could chat, unload all their problems and their grief, and we could help signpost them and offer some strategies and, and it's worked brilliantly. So we set up our listening ear service and we get referrals from GPs, social prescribers, people self-refer, and it's it's been great. And we're at the point now where it's expanded so much that we've trained some volunteers and they are now taking the calls, which has enabled us to widen the service and open it up to more people. It's been great. And certainly COVID has really highlighted that loneliness aspect yes. for people, hasn't it? Absolutely. So having that contact I think it yeah. really helped. It must have been no different. Yeah, and people not being able to go and see their loved ones when they died in hospital, and it's had a massive effect on their grieving and the way that they've coped with their bereavement. Um, and I think just having a stranger to talk to and to say things that perhaps they can't say to their nearest and dearest is actually really helpful. And yeah, it's been great. What I find extraordinary is would this all have happened? without the pandemic mm -hmm. i think it, i think it, some of it might have done but i think it would have taken longer um, and i think what we've done as a county um you know from from a health perspective we've really broken down some of the barriers and the red tape to enable things to happen quickly because actually that's what needed to happen and i think what we're starting to see now is those things that will stay around for yeah. a while that have been really helpful and some of the things that were set up have changed a little bit but actually I don't think anybody wants to take away that feeling of working together and mm -hmm. being able to push forward and to help each other yeah um, and I think you know as a hospice um, actually it's really important for us to share what we know to our colleagues who might have been facing it um, in, a, in a different way to different times so as Claire mentions absolutely about those people that were left um, and feeling quite isolated yeah um, and also you know from an education perspective being able to put what we put on to the website so that people can dip in and dip out and see what the latest thinking is um, and, and making sure that they get get the advice as they can for their clients too and I think um, that breaking down the barriers that making things happen quicker mm -hmm. I think a brilliant example of that is the um, directory we've now got yeah. Uh, on the website mm -hmm. where you can go and it's about all sorts of organisations not just yeah. about Cornwall Hospice Care which was great because we had I mean we knew obviously of a lot and we've been able to signpost people but as we've been going along we've discovered new ones that we didn't know existed and so we were starting to you know excel spreadsheets and notebooks and we thought well, it'd be far more sensible to have somewhere that people can access it as well and so that's been yeah that's been really good too no, I think that's a really exciting piece of work, but but also interesting that things are happening quicker than maybe they would have done. Yeah. You're all nodding yeah, about yeah, this. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it's great. I think we've got to see positives out of all of this, and I think that's one of them, communication. Yeah. And, and the webinars that the team put on, I think, would yes. be a great way of, of being able to contact people. Yeah, yeah and we're, we hope to do another one in the new year. Um, when we've got a few more things to talk about. But yeah, well, they've been great. And just having the chance now to be in a virtual room with people from all over the country. And in our last webinar, we had people from overseas too, 
which you wouldn't get if you were running a real life seminar somewhere would you at all and that was exciting wasn't it you had delegates coming in yeah. to a to a seminar being run online by a cornish charity yeah. from america, america uh, ireland uh europe canada there was somebody from canada, from canada. Yeah, so we, we went global. It was very exciting. <laughs> global sharing of information. Fantastic. <laughs> You're listening to the Cornwall Hospice Care podcast, Two Old Chuffs, A Tale of Two Hospices. I'm Tamsin Thomas. And I'm Gina Stiles. And we're talking today about uh, the difficult year that was 2020-21, uh, this in conjunction with our digital impact report, our, our resilience and revival, and we're kind of picking up on themes that are that's in that report. And one of the other people sat around the table with us is Graham Clark, who's our finance director. I would never presume to put myself in your shoes because I am financially dyslexic, but <laughs> what, what went through your head the day you realised all our shops were going to close, all our fundraising was going to stop, and yet our front line was as busy, if not busier, than it had been before. I wished I was financially dyslexic, I suppose. <laughs> um, I think if you take, take, take ourselves back to March and April of 2020, we didn't really know what was coming, I don't think. I think the messages coming to us at the time was that lockdown one, as it turned into be, was going to be relatively short, Thing that would fix everything and would go back to normal quite quickly. So we knew we had a short-term financial problem that the shops would close and fundraising would be would be challenged, I think. But we didn't know quite how long that would last for. Um, but what I would say, looking back, was that the, the support packages that came to us came to us very quickly and were incredibly well managed and organised. So I'm thinking of the furlough scheme. I think at one time during... The, the very worst of things, we had 124 staff on furlough, so people were were stood down from their roles and sent home and told not to do any work at all, and the government kind of picked up their wages for us, which was terrific. And the speed at which that, that system was built and rolled out and implemented was, was absolutely astonishing. And that was, that was a, a real reassurance to us, I think. Um, and I remember the council stepped in, so... They wanted to support retail, hospitality and leisure businesses to make sure that when this was all over, those businesses could come back. And obviously with 32 shops in the county, we were a big part of that. And I think Cornwall really was one of the fastest counties to, to respond to that and to put in, in place those packages. And again, that, that support money came through very quickly. So as fast as we were, we were losing money, there were ways that we could explore where we could replace some of that lost funding. So um, we ended up, I think, in 2021 being closed and, and partially closed in fundraising for about seven months out of the 12. So that was a big, big gap in our revenue. We missed the lucrative summer season, which is where we make a lot of our money in retail and some of the major events in fundraising. I don't want to steal Oliver's thunder because he sat next to me and we'll, we'll, we'll be able to explain this much more clearly than I can. But we certainly had to, to cancel a lot of our big blue ticket events that we just couldn't get on because it, it was face to face and that was something that wasn't allowed back then in any kind of big way. So the loss of income really ran into the millions. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was easily to recover from. We did some modelling and we knew that we could call on reserves if we needed to, but really that, that's not what the reserves were there for. We had this perfect storm where we had less income coming in, but yet, as we've talked about just now, the demand for what we did was as great as ever, if not greater. I think we had, in terms of inpatients, I think we had the biggest number of inpatients in that year than we'd ever seen 404. in the past. 404, yes. yes. So that was 7 or 8% up on the previous year, and I think the length of stay was probably greater as well, so more complexity in terms of the needs of the patients that were coming to us. So the front line had no kind of respite at all because the, what they had to do was, was keep going and keep going faster and better than ever before. So it was a hugely challenging year. Um, were you scared? I'm going to ask you that question, uh, as well as the people on the front line. 
Were you scared by what was going on? I think it was a fear of, of failing, of not being able to, to keep the funding coming in. Yeah. I think that was what spurred, spurred me on the most. It was, it was to see this huge challenge and, and then look, at, look across and see the, the huge benefit of the work that we were delivering was, was doing. And they were saying, I don't want to be the one that has to go and say, you know, we haven't got the money to keep things open. We can't pay the payroll in in August or whatever that, you know, that would have been an absolute calamity. So that it was that that was what I was scared of, I think, the most was was that inability to keep things moving. But um, we had some very creative uh, people in the in the sort of finance team that looked and understood the rules of what these packages and support interventions were how they apply to us and how we could legitimately claim against them and claim the right amounts against them because scared. One of the other things that was scary was this thing called clawbacks. So if we overclaimed or we got something we weren't entitled to, um, the donor, the government, the council, whoever it is, can come and take it away again. And that's something that we really didn't want for all sorts of reasons, not reputational or the damage that that would do to us as we tried to come out of this and try to recover. So there's lots of things to be scared about, but lots of things to be really proud of, I think, too. And we, we, we came through it with the three lockdowns. We came through it with, with pretty much a balanced budget, um, which I do look back and think, well, how on earth did we manage to <laughs> achieve that with, with what happened and the, and the income streams literally shutting overnight and staying shut for such a long period of time. But, but as I say, I can't compliment the council, the government, the NHS England organisation that stepped in to ensure that our capacity was was re, kind of remained in place for when, as and when they needed it really to, to, to push patients our way. We had to be there with those beds open and available and they gave us some money to make sure we did that. So you put all of those two or three things together and the state did support our sector incredibly well. Um, and I'm very grateful for that because that's what got us through, really. Mm. It's it's great to hear more positives, though, isn't it? Coming out of it, I, I think it is. And I, I, you know, another thing that I, you know, made me think when you were talking is that actually how our organisation, I think, has become closer as an organisation. So, you know, I never thought that I'd be talking to you know, to your team about you know hand sanitizer and masks for the shops. Yes. But actually, to go and yes. and to link in yes. and to. Um, you know, to have that dialogue between um, our perhaps, um, you know, non-clinical areas, I, I think has been really beneficial for us as an organisation. And I think a lot more people started to make the links that you plough on, yeah. don't you, doing your job. But mm. suddenly I think, am I right, Claire, that the, the key workers on the front line maybe suddenly thought, oh, crikey, all the shops are shut. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, how are we going to manage? How is it going to... How are we going to keep going? Yeah, it was uh, yeah really scary, and you know how are we going to get through it all? But, but yeah. the, in a way, that's good because you come out thinking actually those shop that start yeah. those shop teams yeah. are really important. The oh, shop yeah. teams understand, yeah, absolutely. yeah, that we we need them for us to provide the care here. So we're all in it together. Could you look, Ollie Hall, could you look Graham in the eye at any stage <laughs> through this? I should explain Ollie is our head of fundraising. There must have been a moment where you thought, I don't really want to go into the into Graham's office because I can't do anything. Yeah, so um, I think as Graham um, uh, shared at the start there, it was we didn't entirely know what was fully coming our way. So there was this this sort of fear at the start, but I vividly remember telling a number of of, of our team in fundraising who, who were further, don't worry, a couple of weeks and we'll be back and then we'll be focusing on the cycle this summer, famous last words as it were. But, um, you, you know, we, in the fundraising side and with my colleagues in retail, we have this wonderful privilege of funding the care that's delivered at our two hospices mm -hmm. and out into the community. So the utmost respect for my colleagues in the room mm -hmm. who have been through that at, at the front line. That, that privilege is immensely rewarding from our side of things and I think in the first instance we're, we're an events-led fundraising team, we work on volumes, we like to meet people to then try and take people forward for other ways of giving etc and to, to have our bread and butter sort of close overnight so we delivered Run Falmouth on the, the Sunday and I think it was then Friday that we went into lockdown something like that 
So we got the last sort of run in on the calendar, as it were. Um, to have our remit evaporate was was terrifying. Um, and I, I think in that moment of, of sort of terror, because I think if memory serves, there was about three weeks or so from lockdown until we started to get sort of some of the packages come in that would see us through. It, the response was incredible, yeah. as I said, and, and it was fast. Yeah, yeah. So, so those sorts of three weeks, there was a moment of, oh my, what, <laughs> what, what do we do? Um, but at the same time of it being terrifying from changing our world from its absolute norm to upside down, it was immensely liberating because for the first time ever, we really explored a virtual event. I mean, it's never on our radar, but we delivered, I, th this fills me with absolute joy. We use a, a database package that they send around inspirational emails every now and then. And um, one of them was like, hey, look at this amazing Irish charity who's done a virtual marathon and they raised 40,000 pounds. And we shared it around the office and went, uh, we beat them to it and we did 50,000, thanks very much. <laughs> so there was quite, quite sort of validating that we were doing good things. And I, I think we just threw, we threw away the rule book. We looked at say, what can we do with the thousand pounds? And we started again. And we went through over the year sort of three different versions of the battle plan. And I think Claire, you said something about it, it was like going into battle, as it were. And we, yes, we felt yeah. a little like that. You know, yeah. we were yeah. tackling this head on so that, yeah. you know, for our, our small part of making sure the care continued, it was it was there and able to do so. Um, and as the year progressed, we got a little more creative, a little more brave. We started to welcome more of our colleagues back. And um, um, we, we sort of, curtailed everything with uh, this fantastic appeal, which was Terry's Bed Appeal, which features quite heavily in uh, the Resilience and Revival um, uh, report you, you've mentioned, Tamsin. And that was probably our real sort of come out fighting moment. It's when we really had to mobilize everything. And it was our, I don't wanna say cry for help, but it's sort of the best way to describe it. It was the, you know, we've resisted asking our community um, explicitly until now and actually we really really need you uh, just to see us over the, the challenges of, of, of the winter and they did and I, I, I can't thank our community enough for, for coming in and, and helping when we needed them to do so. The, the response to that appeal was extraordinary. Yeah. We set ourselves a target of a, of a quarter of a million and we exceeded that and I frantically tried to remember the total. I think it was <laughs> but it was over a quarter of a million, 286? Yeah, 286,000. Yeah. Which was yeah, mind-bogglingly yeah. wonderful, and a month early as well. We set ourselves six months to do so, and uh, we did it a, a month early. So that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, I it, bizarrely, I think I look back on that year quite fondly of all the sort of wonderful things we did when when the chips were down. I mean, I remember myself sitting and stuffing 400 envelopes with little wooden laser medals because we couldn't buy any in from from overseas so we got them done just outside of Penzance they were laser cut especially for us sent up and um, we were stuffing these envelopes with thank you certificates and people's medals having raised 50,000 on on our virtual marathon Th that was brilliant you know but it was very odd to just sort of have one thing going on at once we're used to having 20 or so plates in the air. But it, was, it will be it was the good. only triathlon medal I ever had. <laughs> yeah, well deserved. Well deserved. You could do it in your own time well and deserved. slowly, fast or whatever. <laughs> it's interesting, and I know I can feel Gina here be, saying, be careful with your words. You talked about throwing the rule book out. <clears throat> Governance aside, because nothing changes <laughs> on that way, I just say. In a way, the whole charity threw the rule book away, D didn't, didn't it? Because things... We've reflected on all the exciting things that have happened as a result of the pandemic. So it's a kind of a positive in a way. Yeah. I think it's it's a hopefully you know it's a, a, a once in a, a working lifetime um, event that actually makes you um, really think and reflect. And I guess you know for, for Ollie thinking about you know you, you must never have the time to think well actually what could we do if we're starting yeah. again you're either inheriting or making things move and and i would absolutely echo you know how supportive our community has been you know in in all kinds of ways so i think absolutely about supporting events and the virtual events um but also we were getting people 
um, you know, hospitality areas that, that had had to close down, they were bringing their bread in for the kitchen because they couldn't use it. We've had people painting pebbles so that we could um, give pebbles to patients who can then give them to, to people, visitors. You know, really lovely ways of, of thinking, people donating um, iPads um, and, you know, ways of keeping contact. So I think that whole creativity of, of how we talk to each other and maintain those relationships has, has been hugely tested but also um, you know it really has made us think think differently I think so where do we go from here I mean for you Ollie so is it back to before or? so interestingly there is we've learned many lessons and um, one of those really exciting pieces is we had an appeal land six days prior to lockdown couldn't have been more poorly timed about sponsoring our nurses it was a drive to get regular giving and um, funny enough, it didn't work. Uh, but what we did is we followed that up with a telesales campaign, and that's been an extraordinary success, talking to people because they were at home. And that sort of lesson in how we try different mediums to communicate people has continued and filtered. And now telesales is one of our, uh, well, for three months running this year, it's been our primary recruitment source into into lottery as, as many things so it's changed a few things but there is an immense drive to get back to the live event as it were i think people have been missing that sort of thing there are only so many times you can run around the garden yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know we, we will take things forward and um uh, we, we're going to come out with the lessons learned I, and i think doing very well doing very well and the same for you graham it's a a different world but you at the bottom, for you, you've still got to bring the money in, haven't you? That doesn't change. Yeah, and again, we came into this year, this new year with a huge amount of uncertainty. Would, would the events that Ollie's planning prove as popular? Was the fatigue with that sort of virtual environment? Um, would people get fed up of doing that? Would the people would, would people come back to the shops? Would 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 the fear of cause some of our shops are quite small, quite enclosed? Would would the footfall drop off? And would retail suffer? Um, there was also this thing about some of our would some of our underlying sources of revenue that I haven't really touched on, such as donations and grants and trusts, would they have been exhausted during the pandemic and had have accelerated some of their giving into a difficult year in 2021 at the expense of 21, 22? So we we didn't know quite what was going to happen. Um, one of our big sources of revenue is legacies. Uh, people leave us gifts in their wills, and that's always a very significant part. In a typical era, it's 40% of everything that we get comes from gifts in wills. And that also slowed down during 2021, and we couldn't quite understand why that was. And then you find out that the solicitors who are processing these things have furloughed their staff and closed their offices and, and shut up shop. And therefore, there was a sort of, we knew there was some kind of, um, delay in processing those things and we hoped that that would come good for us in 21-22. So here we are, we've just gone through the half year position and we are on course for an absolutely outstanding year this year. Um, everything has come back strongly, everything is performing well um, and I think that we, we will undo the damage of, of Covid this year and then quite a bit more. So our financial position and our financial strength at the end of this year see, is set to be the best it's been for many, many years, if if not forever. Wow. So Absolutely. there are some positives. Um, and I think everyone deserves a positive, yes, don't they? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. You know, we had to make some difficult decisions. We, 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 did, we did have to lose some staff, uh, unfortunately, predominantly from our retail organisation during the, the difficult times. Um, but as I see, as I, as I look at what, what's happening, I think we are replacing some of those jobs Quite successfully at the moment and we actually have vacancies and it's it's gone from you know that place where you've got too many staff to it being difficult to recruit actually into some of the key roles that we've got so very different set of challenges I think but but financially I think the strength has come back well, I'm really delighted to be able to There's say a twinkle that. in your <laughs> eye it's <laughs> definitely a twinkle in your eye um, however um on the side of the care, we're still wearing masks. We're sat around here all wearing masks. We're still hand sanitising. Yeah. We're not quite out of 
the woods in terms of health, are we? No, not not yet, and I think that will be um, be a while. I think we still need to, um, you know, care for our vulnerable patients. So actually, it's really important that we um, stick to those rules that we've all come to know. Um, and so, so yeah, I think you know we'll change when we can and slowly open up. Um, but at the minute, actually, we have to be safe. And is that is that has it become the norm for you yeah. now? Yeah, absolutely. It, it would be odd not doing what we're doing, I think. Going back to easier, different times. But no, I think we're all adapted to it now. And it, yeah, it's part of our life, part of our working life. So, and the same for you, I imagine, Claire. Yeah, I mean, we've, we're not doing anything face-to-face still as yet. We're still very much on the phone. There are plans to, when we can. Um, you know, there's a plan to open a community hub out, out in the community where we can do workshops and we can see people face to face. But on the whole, at the minute, it's working. I mean, we do speak to people who, you know, are, are lonely and isolated and they would like to be with people. Um, but it, it's slowly, it's slowly starting. And yeah, so we've got plans, but I think it'll be a mixture of both. So I guess um, in turn, it is almost like a New Year's resolution. What what is your desire by the end of this financial year? Let's start with you, Ollie. Um, to exceed budget. You would say that. Was that next? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that would give us confidence that the returning way we're positioning ourselves in what we're feeling from a fundraising market is is becoming a post-COVID world, is going in the right direction. I think that would be validating that we've done the right things, we've made the right calls, and uh, what we're asking for is working. Uh, so, so yeah, that's that would be my plan. Similar, I think. Uh, we beat budget, we, we, we go out of this year with, with a great deal of financial strength. So if anything like this ever happens again, God forbid, that, that we're able to deal with it in a much more um, we could we could stand on our own feet in a much more stable way and, and deal with it ourselves. And know we're going to come out the other end. And know that we're going to come out of the other end. Yeah. We'd just like to keep developing the things that we want to keep developing, keep moving in that direction. But also, we'd like to start coming along to fundraising events and being with fundraising as well. That would be really nice. Yeah, exciting. Working together, yeah. bringing and uh, knocking down walls and and. Yeah, <laughs> understanding each other. That goes back yeah. to what Claire said about, doesn't it? Uh, about the yeah. key workers beginning to realise actually the shop workers are vital. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And for you, Claire, um, I just like it. I know we're doing our. We're, we haven't ever come down with our high standards of care, and, and I just think I just want to continue doing that. I, I think for me, it's about keeping everybody safe. Um, ongoingly and I think you know whether that's um, finance or you know kind of working together with our our other colleagues and I think there is something about not losing um, not forgetting what we've learned I suppose is the word that I you know how we work and working together I think it's it's huge to take forward well it's been fascinating talking to everyone and, and feeling a real positive vibe in the room despite what's been a horrific 18 months in some ways. Thank you for joining us, Claire, Claire, Graham and Ollie. Uh, lovely to see you too, Gina. And if you'd like to take a look at the Digital Impact Report, our resilience and revival, then all you need to do is visit our website. It's cornwallhospicecare.co.uk. You've been listening to Two Old Chuffs, A Tale of Two Hospices.